will talk about perfectoid species and their applications. Please welcome our speaker. Thank you for the introduction and many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. So, let's see. Uh, this works? Okay, great. So, uh, so, let me start with the introduction. So, so, some of the aim of today's lecture is to give you some idea of what these crazy perfectoid spaces are and uh, what they might be good for. And so, throughout my whole talk, I fix a prime number p. And you should really think of this as being some small fixed prime number. So I'm a big fan of the prime twos. It's perfectly fine. Um, and so my talk will be about two distinct but very parallel worlds. Um, so one is the world which I'm really interested in is the field of periodic numbers. So you can think of these as some formal periodic uh, series expansions. And times p to the n, where these coefficients, as usual, are numbers from 0 to p minus 1. But now, we don't allow very negative powers of p, but we allow very positive powers of p. So these could be sort of as infinite uh, expansions, which are infinite to the left, if you want. So this might be a typical element of, say, five adic numbers. And so the addition works in the usual way, so you add this carry. So if you add 2 plus 4, mod 5, it's 1, but then you have to carry 1 around. All right? And so this field of periodic numbers arises very naturally if you somehow consider two rational numbers as being close if they are congruent modulo a high power of p. And so there is a very similar field. So formally, so it's the field of Laurent series over fp, it's called, where fp is a field with p elements. And so it's again the same, same sums a n times 2 to the n, but now this t is a formal variable. So Concretely, this means that the elements may be the same, but you add without carrying. And so, this Laurent series field is really has an independent variable t, and you can somehow think of this as functions on some punctured disk. Just like if you have, with a complex number, is a punctured disk, then functions on it can be developed into a Laurent series. <coughs> and so, this means that this Laurent series field is very geometric in nature. On the other hand, although QP looks formally also like a long series in the variable P, this P is really a fixed number, you get it by P adding P times 1 to itself. And so, in fact, there are no automorphisms of QP, for example, whereas there are many automorphisms of the long series field, but because you can send T to anything else, essentially. And so this makes the theory of QP very arithmetic in nature. There's another important difference between those two fields. The first is of characteristic P, and the other is of characteristic 0. And so, also what I'm trying to do in my talk is to find a passage between two very different worlds of characteristic 0 and characteristic p. So characteristic 0 is what we're used to where complex manifolds and so on live. Whereas over characteristic p, or finite fields, we have all these other interesting structures such as the veil conjectures and everything. And so it's um, it's a very important question whether you can transfer some information between the two worlds, and in fact, there are several approaches that allow you to, do, to, to deduce transformation from one world to the other. And one classical thing uh, that's done by a model theory, classically, is, that, is to say that as you send p to infinity, in some sense, qp becomes in some sense isomorphic to the wrong series field. In some sense, the only difference, which is the difference in characteristic, goes away as you send p to infinity. So that's the theorem due to x corpus, and what they use it classically for is um, to transport the theorem of Lang to QP. So the theorem of Lang is the following. If you have a homogeneous polynomial of degree d in many variables, more than d squared variables, then this will always have a non-zero solution of a wrong series field. And as was conjectured, that's the same property should hold over QP. Now, um, if you use this model series statement of arcs uh, you can show that if you fix the integer d, and you take p, which is large, com large compared to d, um, then any homogeneous polynomial of degree d in d squared plus 1 variables, again, will have a non zero solution of the qp. So this way, you can transfer information from one field to the other. But there are counterexamples for small p. So if you are interested in a fixed p, this really gives you no information at all a priori. 
And uh, this kind of method was also, is also one of the ways that you prove, that you finish the proof of the fundamental lemma, say, uh, over QP. So what Ngo did is prove a version of the fundamental lemma over a Laurent series field. And, but then by either appealing to the world of Valls Berger or to some model theory, you can transfer it to QP. But as I said, I'm interested in the fixed P, so let's say P is 2, so it gives me no information. Um, so one way in which I might be interested in the field is in the theory of finite extensions of this field. And so this is encoded in this absolute governor group of this field, which is a uh, group of automorphisms of the separable closure of K, uh, which fix the subfield K. So this, in some sense, controls the finite separable extensions of K uh, by Gonglas theory. And then there is this amazing theorem of Fontaine and Vincent Berger from 1968, which says the following, that the absolute power groups of QP and the long series fields are very different. But as soon as you join a lot of p-power roots of P to QP, or all p power roots of Q p to qp, then the absolute gamma groups will be canonically isomorphic. In other words, there is a canonical procedure to pass back and forth between finite separable extensions of these two very different fields. This is, in fact, a very unusual thing. So there is a subject called uh, Anderbian geometry, whose aim is somewhat to show that if you have two different fields k and l, then the absolute gamma groups will essentially never be isomorphic, except in trivial circumstances. So, this is really a very, very surprising result. Um, used crucially in Katie Koch's theory, and um, one might even make the statement look a little more symmetric if one notes the following that if one it, it joins all the p power roots of t to this Laurent series field, so I'm imitating what we did in characteristic zero, then actually in characteristic p this wouldn't change anything because it is a purely inseparable extension and this doesn't change um, the separable extensions. So, what we see is, uh, is that at least for these fields, as soon as we join lots of p-power roots to the characteristic zero side, the two sides look exactly the same in some sense. And perfectoid spaces is about generalizing this to spaces. So first I want to talk about perfectoid fields, which is essentially a generalization of this theorem of Fontaine and Vinton Berger I just said, then algebras and then spaces finally. So let's go. So what are perfectoid fields? So they should answer the question of which fields am I, so in the theorem of Fontaine and Vinton Berger we had this field which is QP where you join all P per roots of P. Which other fields could I uh, plug in and still get such a theorem? So, the natural context for this is what's called a perfectoid field. It's a complete non archimedean field, so just as QP or any such field, so it has a norm which is given by the PLD evaluation or something like this. Um, the first requirement is that the norm map to the uh, non field number says dense image. This says that this field is infinitely, rami infinitely ramified. So we do not allow discretely valued fields like QP. We really want lot of ramification in them. And then there's a the requirement that they are p-adic in some sense, or of characteristic p, which you can phrase as saying that the absolute value of p is less than 1. But now comes the crucial condition that if you look at the ring of integers in this perfectoid field, so that's the those elements of norm at most 1, so if you would do this for qp, you might end up with zp. Um, and then you reduce this mod p, this ring of integers, um, then this now is a ring of characteristic P, and so on it you have this Frobenius map. The rising to the P's power is not just multiplicative but also additive in characteristic P. And uh, the requirement is that this P's power map is surjective, which is somehow phrasing this condition that you have lots of P power roots in some sense. Okay, so what are examples of this? So I required my fields to be complete, so you will have to complete every field I write here. So take the field occurring in this serial of Fontana Vinton Magie, take QP and join all P powers of P. You might also take the whole algebraic closure of QP if you like. And other examples would be the characteristic P analogs of these two fields. So take this wrong series field, join all P powers of T, 
uh, to <coughs> the algebraic or set over closure of FP along series G. The completion will be the same. Um, a word about the name perfectoid. So this comes from the notion of perfect rings in characteristic P. So a ring of R of characteristic P is called perfect if the Frobenius map is an isomorphism. And so if my uh, perfectoid field was of characteristic P, then the condition is just that it's perfect. And this perfectoid thing is a way to make sense of this perfect condition still in characteristic zero, although you're really in characteristic P. Uh, also, this perfect is something which is only ca present characteristic P. And so that's also why I have to make this strange transition to ring of integers and then not P phrases. <coughs> okay, and so in this theorem of Fontaine and Winter Berger, we saw that there is this characteristic zero perfectoid field, and then there was another field such that they had the same finite separable extensions. And so, let's a general construction called tilting, that's an old construction Pierre de Koch theory due to Fontaine. So let's fix any perfectoid field K. And our goal is to construct a new perfectoid field called the tilt of K, or K flat, which is of characteristic P always. And we'll agree with the field we started with, with if it was already of characteristic P. So somehow you should think of this K here as being of characteristic zero. And so the construction is some construction. If you haven't seen it, you probably not see the, how it works. But so you have the Frobenius map on the ring of integers mod p. You take the inverse limit over Frobenius. This will produce some ring called OK flat, which can, you can also identify with the inverse limit over the piece power map on the ring of integers. And then you pass the refraction field over this. And to give you some idea that this does the correct thing, if k is the completion of qp where you join all p parallels of p, then this tilt would be the corresponding characteristic p field. And so in general, there's a similar functor which takes the characteristic zero thing to the analogous, in some sense, characteristic p. And so the proposition is that you do, do always end up with a perfectoid field of characteristic p. And as a set and out with multiplication, you can actually describe it easily. It's just the inverse limit over much over the piece power map on this field K. It's harder to describe addition because the addition is not compatible with this uh, identification in this inverse limit. So you don't add pointwise in this inverse limit. Uh, in particular, if you project to the last term in this inverse limit, you get a continuous multiplicative map from the tilt back to the field itself, uh, which because it goes in the opposite direction is denoted by x max to x sharp. So, again, let me explain what this does in an example. So, if k is the completion of my favorite field, uh, then this element t in the tilt, I told you that the tilt is the wrong series field, perfected, uh, must correspond to some sequence of numbers in my field k, which uh, are related under, the, which are successive piece roots of another. And so, there is an obvious choice here it's p, the piece root of p, the p squared root of p, and so on. In particular, because the sharp map is just a projection to the last term, this means that T-sharp will be P. On the other hand, if you try to evaluate some other simple expression, 1 plus T-sharp, this will involve a periodic limit procedure. And so the answer will be this periodic limit. So you replace T by a high P power root of P, takes the P to the nth power of this, and then it turns out that as you let n go to infinity, this converges periodically. And this is the sharp map. And you should think of uh, this map x back to x sharp as some kind of canonical replace t by p function. So it really replaces t by p, but in general, just naively replacing t by p in this uh, expansion wouldn't be canonical, but this is. All right. But it also shows. I mean, this formula also shows that this map x max to x sharp is a very analytic map. It's certainly not algebraic, because you have to take this period limit. <coughs> OK, so we were trying to understand the theorem of Fontaine and Winter and Berger. And so the following theorem, which generalizes this, was, was observed independently by Kate Lai and Leo and the speaker. So that's the following. So take any perfectoid field. Oops. Uh, then first of all, whenever you have a finite extension of it, it will still be perfectoid. And so this means that 
Again, you can apply this tilting function to it. You get, you get a perfected field L flat, which is now an extension of K flat. And this defines this equivalence of categories between the finite extensions of those two fields. <coughs> it also preserves the degree and so on. Preserves all the structure. And so this implies in particular that the absolute Gara groups of these two fields are isomorphic. Um, for the experts, I'm omitting the word separable here, but that's because uh, for a perfective field, all extensions are separable. Because they, if they have characteristic zero, that's clear anyway. If they have characteristic, if they have characteristic zero, it's clear anyway. If they have characteristic p, then they are perfect. And so, that's true again. Um, all right, so now we understand some, uh, what happens for a field, but really we want to do some geometry. So we want to compare some geometric objects over one field with geometric <coughs> objects over the other field. And let me explain what happens in the example of the affine line. Certainly the easiest example, probably, of the space. Uh, so, and let's call, call the coordinate on this line uh, T. Um, then my claim is that, in some sense, the affine line over this characteristic P field is the inverse limit over the P's power map on the affine line over this characteristic zero field. So in some sense, the characteristic P variety is an infinite covering of the characteristic zero variety. Um, <laughs> well, this is not a completely unreasonable thing to hope for. So we saw that, so let's take points on both sides. So on points, the left-hand side is just k flat, and this a1 over k is just k. And we had seen this identification that the tilt, at least on points, can be identified with this inverse limit. And <coughs> the same is true for any finite extent, for corresponding finite extensions on both sides. So in particular, this means that whatever this isomorphism is, as some other map on points, it's supposed to be the map which sends the point x to this x sharp, x1 over p sharp, and so on. But I just told you that this map x maps to x sharp is totally non-algebraic, and so it's a very <laughs> analytic thing. And so uh, if we want to formalize this in any way, we certainly have to use some kind of analytic geometry to do this. Um, note also the similarity here in the geometric setup with what happened on the base. So on the base we had to join a lot of p-power roots before things became similar. And here we have to do exactly the same. We have to join a lot of p-power roots of the coordinate t, and then things look similar. All right. <coughs> so, <coughs> so in algebraic geometry, if you want to define some spaces, then these spaces are just defined by what functions are on the space. And if you do analytic geometry, then these rings will be Banach algebra, so they are equipped with some topology. Um, and so, thus, if I want to define what a perfect algebra is, it's supposed to be some Banach algebra over my field K, with a small topological condition, which in particular implies that the ring is reduced. So, you have the suffering of power bounded elements, which you should think of as the ring of suffering of integral elements. And you require again that if you mod out P, then the Frobenius map is surjective. It's just the analog of the condition that we uh, asked for uh, for, uh, for fields. And uh, let me give an example. So, if R was this. Uh, so the simplest example is if that you take k and then you join not just the variable t but also all its p power roots and take some kind of convergent power series to make it a Banach algebra. Um, uh, this r actually occurs in our example because it essentially gives functions on the inverse limit of the affine line over the piece power map. And again, this remark about why this is called perfecto, it's a, the field, base fields of characteristic P, uh, this last condition I'm requiring there, is equivalent to requiring that the swing is perfect. And in classical analytic geometry for periodic fields, there's this notion of an affinoid algebra. And so a perfecto algebra is some kind of perfect affinoid algebra. That's where the name comes from. All right, so, uh, this relation between the two fields 
uh, was given by this tilting procedure, so we have to generalize this to algebras. But actually, it's not difficult. You just do the same thing. So let R be a perfect type K algebra. You take its <coughs> integral elements mod P. You have a surjective Frobenius map on it, takes the inverse limit. You get some ring, which again, as a set, can be identified as <coughs> this inverse limit of a piece power map. And then <coughs> you again pass to the generic fiber of the sky by tensoring from the ring of integers of this field K flat to K flat B. And so, again, in the examples, it just does the expected thing. So if you have the ring of uh, convergent power series in a variable t and all its p power roots, then the tilt will just be the same thing over the other field. And so, a theorem that I found very surprising when I realized that this has to be true is that this functor is actually a an equivalence of categories between the category of perfect dot algebras on one side and the category of perfect dot algebras on the other side. So, to me, it came totally unexpected that it is even possible that there is some there are some objects in characteristic zero and some objects in characteristic p which are literally equivalent. Um, but once you realize that this has to be true, it's actually also not so hard to prove. Um, all right. And so, so spaces will be just um, the spaces that have where these are the functions on. Um, but so we want to do some analytic geometry, and so there are several frameworks that we could use to do analytic geometry. So the first framework <coughs> was proposed by Tate. It's are his rigid analytic varieties. He did this in the late 60s, I think. Um, but they have some strong finiteness assumptions built in, which are certainly not satisfied for these kind of perfect dot algebras I'm interested in. So the perfect dot algebras are essentially never in a serial, which might cause a lot of trouble, but unfortunately doesn't really. Um, the next framework, which was slightly better, was Ber proposed by Berkowitz. It's the so-called analytic spaces in the late 80s. And then there was this framework which I like much better. It's called Eddick spaces. They were introduced by Huber in the early 90s. Um, so, I want to use them. So let me just very briefly say what, what they are. So if you have a perfect dot algebra, so some Banach algebra, then you attach to it some space. And what's the space? So in usual algebraic geometry, you would attach to just a ring. It's a set of prime ideals. Um, what Tate did, he associated to a ring its maximal ideals which is enough information in the case of some finite type algebras, but not in general. What Berkowitz did is he considered all uh, multiplicative semi-norms. And what Huber did is he considered all valuations, actually. So that's actually, in the spirit of some very old tradition going back to Krull in the early 20th century, uh, of studying algebraic geometries through the space of all valuations on the ring, possibly of high rank. And so that's actually what you do. So you consider the space of continuous valuations, and then on the space you get some structure sheaf. In general, only pre sheaf, but it turns out to be a sheaf here. So, <coughs> all right. So now we do this to our, uh, to our perfect dot algebra, and it's tilt. So we get two different spaces. So both are topological spaces equipped with some. Uh, structure sheaf, some sheaf of algebras. And then the first miracle was that the underlying topological spaces turned out to be homeomorphic. And so now you have one topological space equipped with two different structure sheaves. Um, fortunately, the structure sheaf turns out to be a sheaf of perfect dot algebras. So whenever you evaluate on some reasonable op open subset, uh, it will be a perfect dot K algebra again. And the structure sheaf on the tilted space is just the tilt of the structure sheaf. So if you are given a space, the space x, then you can completely recover the space x flat just by somehow taking the same space and taking the tilt of the structure sheaf. All right, so let me put this up again. And so uh, if you know this, then you can define general space by doing these simple pieces, these affinity. Spaces. Just like you define a scheme to be something glued out of 
<laughs> affine schemes out of the spectra of some rings. And so it's now formal that the resulting categories over these two fields will be equivalent. So now we have essentially achieved our goal of defining categories of spaces over those two fields which are just literally equivalent. But uh, probably I have to mention a few examples to convey that this is anything reasonable. So uh, let's go back to our example of the affine line. So in this case, what I claim is that, first of all, if I take the inverse limit over the piece power map and I1, consider it as some analytic space, then this will be a perfectoric space, and its tilt will be exactly the same thing in characteristic P. And that's actually easy to verify. It's essentially just the example I gave uh, of a perfectoric algebra, just no, put into a space. So, as a picture, this is the following. So, you have x, which is the t inverse limit of this tau I wrote there. You have x flat, which is a similar inverse limit in characteristic p. And that this is a tilt, this means that these spaces are pretty much the same. And so, for example, if I pass to underlying topological spaces, then the theorem I just stated says that on the top line, I really get an isomorphism now. But, uh, Actually, this whole tower becomes a tower of homeomorphisms because for being is a homeomorphism characteristic P. Let me put this up here. So we have this tower, so I recall that uh, for being is a homeomorphism characteristic P, so all these become homeomorphisms, so everything here is a homeomorphism. And so in particular, this implies that you might identify the underlying space of X right up there. Uh, with the underlying topological space of this A1 over this tilted field, which gives us the homeomorphism uh, of the topological spaces underlying the eddic spaces, uh, that the underlying topological space of this A1 in characteristic P is this inverse limit of the A1s in characteristic zero. So, in some sense, you can view now characteristic P geometry as an infinite covering of characteristic zero geometry. Let me do one more example. So we might also do the same for a projective space. <coughs> um, so again, some of the bad thing about perfectoid spaces is that usual spaces are not perfectoid. You always have to pass some highly ramified infinite covering before it is perfectoid. And so for this, you always have to make some choice. And so one choice you could do is to pick a lift of Frobenius on your variety. And for a projective space, it's extremely easy to write down a lift of Frobenius. You just raise on to the piece powers uh, on the coordinates. But the same example that I'm going to give works for any variety equipped with a lift of Frobenius. Namely, if you take this inverse limit of Frobenius on this projective space of a K, this is a perfectoid space, and it has a tilt corresponding same characteristic P. So actually, You should think of these uh, perfectoid spaces as somehow being associated to the dynamical system, which is a variety together with this chosen Frobenius lift. Um, so, so I will come back to this example later, but let me mention some other uh, natural examples of perfectoid spaces, or uh, better, of natural towers of varieties whose inverse limit is perfectoid. So there are some examples where you can just copy the procedure here. So for a toy variety, you can do exactly the same thing as for projective space or the affine line. Um, for beam varieties, it's also usually possible to write down a lift of Frobenius. Um, and so you get relations between a beam varieties with different characteristic. Um, or also for p-divisible groups, if you like. But then there, so in all these three cases, you can also describe explicitly what the tilt is. But then there are some other situations for Shimura varieties and Rappaport Sink spaces. So Shimura varieties, there are some moduli spaces of mean varieties, and similarly, Rappaport Sink spaces are moduli spaces for p divisible groups. And um, they come in natural towers because you're allowed to vary the level. And so if you let the le level at p go to infinity, you get a natural tower which will turn out to be perfectoid in the inverse limit. So as I said, in the first three cases, you can describe the tilt. But for these moduli spaces, I don't think it is possible to describe the tilt. Um, so the first application 
which is still part of the theory of perfectoid spaces is the so-called almost purity theorem. So the almost purity theorem was formulated in some form by Fartings and was the technical cornerstone to his approach to Pierre de Koch theory, much as the fontaine winterberg theorem underlined essentially all work in Pierre de Koch theory, so on, absolute Pierre de Koch theory, and Fartings uh, wants to do relative Pierre de Koch theory. And so this almost purity theorem was really crucial for a lot of work in Pierre de Koch theory. And so in the modern formulation, it says the following. Um, if you have a perfectoid algebra and a finite total extension of it, then uh, in general, you, would, you wouldn't expect this finite total extension to be unramified also on the special fiber. But the funny thing that turns out in this case is that there's almost no ramification in the precise sense. So this word almost occurring there is a technical term. So there is a whole almost mathematics developed by Fortings. Um, so the ring of integers of S is almost finitely tall over R, over the ring of integers of R. It means that there's almost no ramification anymore in the special fiber after you pass up these huge extensions to go to perfectoid algebra. So some version of this was given by Fortings in 1990 in the case of good reduction, and then an improved version in 2002 in the case of semi-stable or some more general toric reduction. But it was always the case that he would, had to construct his perfectoid algebra in a very prescribed manner. So he had to start with something, a finite type over ZP, and then adjoin some p-power roots in a very, very prescribed way. And this also limited the applications of this almost purity theorem, because you always had to ensure that you're in this very special situation uh, where Fartings had proved the theorem. And uh, to the experts, it actually came as a very big surprise that this theorem could be true in this generality. They expected that much more careful assumptions would be needed to have such a theorem. Um, the argument I use is an entirely different argument than the one that Fortings has used. Um, and it goes, as all things in, for perfectoid spaces, by reducing it to the similar statement in characteristic P, where I should note that in the case of characteristic P, the theorem is very easy. And so to reduce this to characteristic P, the crucial step is to compare finite to tall algebras over the perfectoid algebra and its tilt. So that's the following theorem, which was also proved independently by Kit Lawyer and Liu. That if you have a per so it's some of the analog of the fontaine winterberg result. That if you have a perfectoid algebra and you have a finite tall extension, someone replaces this finite field extension, then this is still a perfectoid algebra. So you can again play this game of taking the tilt to get an R-flat algebra. And this turns out then to give an equivalence of categories between the finite tall algebras on either side. Um, so this is, as I said, a relative variant of the theorem of fontaine winterberg And the proof goes by reducing it to the theorem of fontaine winterberg actually. So what you do is you localize on the perfectoid space <coughs> and you reduce to the case of a point. And in the case of a point, this is really just the theorem of fontaine winterberg in its general form. <coughs> and so we get a bunch of nice polars out of this. So uh, the first is that there is a reasonably tall site, which you need to define a tall cohomology, etc., uh, which is preserved under tilting, as we would like. So, in particular, if you go back to the example of projective space, <coughs> so there we had seen that on underlying topological spaces, the projective space of a, this characteristic P field is this infinite covering of the projective space of this characteristic zero field. But exactly the same thing is then also true on a tall topoi. So thinking of a tall topoi as some kind of generalized topological space, and it ties in pretty well. So in particular, um, if you look at the following map, which is not really a map, uh, which goes from the projective space over this characteristic P field to the projective space over the characteristic zero field, just by applying this sharp map on all the coordinates, um, then this is at least well-defined on topological spaces and etal sites. So, let me now mention some applications. So, there are by now a couple of applications. So, the original application was to some cases of the great monotony conjecture. And then there were some applications to Pierre de Koch's theory. Um, a bunch of other stuff. 
I would like to mention uh, the classification of p-divisible groups, um, which I won't be able to go into, but which gives a very nice periodic analog of Riemann's classification of complex abelian varieties. These p-divisible groups are again classified by the first singular homology together with the Hodge filtration. And to the construction of color representations, and I want to con concentrate today on the weight monotony conjecture of periodic Hodge series and the construction of color representations. So what's this weight monotony conjecture? <coughs> so one of the important open conjectures in the atomic homology of varieties. So this can be formulated in either of the two worlds. Uh, so it's either find the of QP or of this Laurent series field. And over it we have some smooth projective variety. So smooth closed sub-variety of projective space. And so associated to it we have by Groton D it's LLA cohomology groups, where I fix the prime L, which is not P. You might also formulate some conjecture of LSP, but I won't talk about this. So, what do you know about the structure of this representation? So, in the similar situation where this variety would be defined over a finite field, you would have some whale conjectures uh, which tell you that the eigenvalues of Frobenius on this are whale numbers, so they are, have some prescribed complex absolute value. Uh, you have something similar happening here, except that different weights can appear. Um, so you have a weight decomposition into different weight spaces uh, where the weight runs from 0 to 2i, introduced from 0 to 2i, where um, the Frobenius x reveal numbers of weight j on this weight j piece. Um, so it may be a bit surprising that different weights appear, but you should think of this as an analog of um, a family of smooth projective varieties over a punctured disk uh, over the complex numbers which gives you a limiting mix mixed host structure. And so that's the analog of this limiting mixed host structure. And so this also comes with the monotony operator, which goes from the weight j piece to the weight j minus 2 piece, which comes from the action of inertia. And so what's the weight monotony conjecture, which Deleen essentially formulated from 1970, says is that if there are different weights, then they are explained by a non-trivial monotony operator. Um, so the monotony operator is always as non-trivial as possible given the weights, which can be concretely phrased as saying that uh, for all j greater or equal to zero, the nth power is an isomorphism from the weight i plus j piece to the weight i minus j piece. So this looks also a bit like the uh, hard left shed theorem, except that we don't compare different cohomology groups now, but we are within one cohomology group. And what Deleen proved in his well two paper in 1980 in particular is that this conjecture is true if k is a finite extension of the Laurent series field. And so what I was originally trying to do with perfectoid spaces is to deduce the similar result over QP uh, by using perfectoid spaces to somehow switch between the characteristics. And so in some situations this works, so that's quite a mouthful what's written there, so essentially it says that X is a complete intersection in a toric variety. For example, a smooth hypersurface in projective space, which is already a new case, so in this case, the weight monogamy conjecture is true. Okay. So how does this work? So, of course, we always have to pass to some perfect toric field, so let's just join all P powers of P. And it doesn't matter for, so the, you still see the weight and the monotony structure after passing to this extension. And so let's work just with a hypersurface and projective space. So we have this hypersurface and projective space embedded into projective space. And we have this strange map from the projective space and characteristic P uh, to this characteristic zero projective space, it's meant pi, um, which is defined at least on topological spaces. So you can at least take the inverse image of the soft variety as a topological. And so if this inverse image happened to be an algebraic variety, then it's easy to get a map on cohomology just by pulling back, because you have this uh, comparison of etal cycles as well. And then you could conclude by the lean by using the result on this inverse image. Unfortunately, this inverse image is essentially never algebraic, because our map pi is not algebraic. Um, so for example, it meets a line in infinitely many points. 
So it's some kind of hypersurface of infinite degrees. It looks like, kind of some, like some kind of fractal uh, in the sky. Uh, but what you can still do is you can still approximate this kind of fractal in projector space by algebraic varieties. Um, that's because this guy is just defined by one equation, so to approximate, I just have to approximate one equation, and this I can figure out how to do. And in general, that's the point where the assumption enters that I have a complete intersection. If I could do this approximation in general, then the Wagner algebra conjecture would fall in general. So, it's enough to get algebraic varieties which are very close to this fractal. Um, so, in the remaining minutes, I want to uh, quickly go through two other applications. So the first is to create a Koch theory. And so, uh, I work with QP, say, and I have a, the analog of a compact complex manifold, which I, of course, very well studied, for example, in Hodge theory. Uh, so the analog of a compact complex manifold in this setup would be what's called a proper smooth rigid analog variety. But you think just of this as a compact p adic manifold. Um, and so there are a bunch of basic theorems about uh, compact manifolds. So for example, their singular cohomology is finite. And so we have an analog of this result here for uh, these compact periodic manifolds. So their entire cohomology of CP, this is what we play singular cohomology, is finitely generated and it's zero in degrees bigger than twice the dimension, as you would expect. What's funny to observe here is that over the complex numbers, Twice the dimension comes from the fact that the complex numbers are of dimension two over the real numbers. So that the compact n dimensional manifold has topological dimension two n. Uh, but over the periodic field, there is no such thing as the real numbers. And so the twice the dimension comes up again, but for completely different reasons. Um, then you have a comparison between singular cohomology and the round cohomology. Um, which in this case said that the, the correct way to phrase this comparison is that the scalar representation uh, on the QP cohomology is Durham with associated vector space given by Durham cohomology. So it gives you some comparison between it singular and Durham cohomology. And the last thing you have in the case of complex, complex manifolds is that sometimes the Hodge to Durham spectral sequence generates by Hodge theorems. But in the complex case, you have to assume that the variety is catered, or the manifold is catered for this to be true. In the PD case, it's true always. Uh, so the Hotschild Raum spectral sequence degenerates always at E1. You shouldn't make of this the statement that um, all PD manifolds are catered. So there are, um, for example, the Hopf surface, which is an example of a non catered compact, complex manifold, has a PD analog. But fortunately, in this, for the Hopf surface, Hotschild Raum generation still holds true. So. There is no contradiction. Uh, for reasons of lack of time, I won't go to the proof, but instead mention another application, uh, so the existence of color representations. So that's somehow uh, in the spirit of the Langlands program, so you have an automorphic representation and you want to find an associated color representation. And an automorphic representation is something which is of characteristic zero, but actually uh, my theory also works um, for some are mod p automorphic forms in some sense, which you can define as to the FP cohomology of locally symmetric spaces. Um, in particular for torsion classes, uh, probably only the experts can understand what I'm talking about, so let me give an example of what I'm talking about. So let, let's consider the group GL2 or SL2 of the Gaussian integers. So it's some nice arithmetic group, and let's maybe take some congruence group gamma inside of it. Uh, and then you can form the quotient of hyperbolic free space by the action of this uh, discrete group gamma and gets what's called uh, Bianchi manifolds. They were introduced already in 1982 by the Italian differential geometry Bianchi. So they are well studied objects, both in differential geometry and in number theory. Um, and they have very large torsion subgroups in their singular cohomology with integral coefficients. So in particular, there are many FP classes. Uh, there are many classes of the cohomology with FP coefficients which do not lift to characteristic zero, and which, until recently, we had ab absolutely no means of studying. We, so the characteristic zero cohomology we could relate by Franke's theorem to 
uh, automorphic representations, and then there's a well-established theory of automorphic representations with which you can do a lot. But we had no idea how to get our handle at all on these uh, mod p cohomology classes. But uh, what I can prove in this very general setup up there, but just stated in this special case here, is the conjecture that Grunewald made in the 70s, which says that for any system of vector eigenvalues which appears in this cohomology group, there exists an associated Galois representation, um, which is associated to it in the usual sense that for Venus eigenvalues match with second eigenvalues. Okay, let me stop. Or comments? That last theorem, you for every uh, system of Hecke eigenvalues, you get uh, um, an automorphic representation for which the, the a Galois representation, not a Galois, Galois. Sorry, a Galois representation for which the uh, eigenvalues match. Yes, yes. Uh, that's been open for a long time, I think. As I said, I mean, the first conjecture in the spirit, I think, was uh, was by Grunewald in the seventies. So it's some probably 40 years ago. There, I remember that he was matching up for Yeah, so he had some ideas of how to construct them, but so my proof is totally just different from what he had in mind. So is, is it right that the Betty numbers of these things tend to be small? Yes, so the, the thing is that uh, there tends to be very few characteristic zero cohomology, but a whole lot of characteristic P cohomology. So the torsion subgroup in the H1 or H2 probably uh, is of exponential growth, I think, or something like this. So there are people working with analytic torsion, Bejaron Venkatej and people, who can give precise bounds on how large the torsion is, and it's really enormous. And there are also computer examples where there's some, for some still big, I mean, for some subgroups gamma, which are just gamma naught of p for some very small p, they produce torsion for some primes, which are some 13 digit primes or so. And so the theorem produces some gamma representations, which are very little ramified. It's really a theorem of, about very sporadic behavior. That's why it's hard to get your hand Any other questions? Uh, if you start with a uh, field of characteristic P, yes. can you construct a field of characteristic C such that this plan uh, is, is the original field? Um, yes, yeah, so the question was whether if I have a characteristic P field, whether I can construct a characteristic zero field whose tilt is this uh, field of characteristic P, and the answer is yes. And there is the possibilities of doing so are param parameterized by a one-dimensional object, actually, which is essentially called the Fark Fontaine curve. Okay, so I have to toss this gift.